Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Shalom. We uh, just returned yesterday from uh, almost three and a half weeks in uh, the Middle East, taking a couple laps around uh, Israel and Jordan. And uh, the words of uh, the hymn we just sang, our original uh, words are uh, in a a glass case in the uh, foyer of the American Colony Hotel there in Jerusalem, uh, where we had two different dinners with two different groups, a a dinner each, and uh, I got to see and photograph that uh, original manuscript of the words of that song we just sang that looks forward to our Lord's return. So it's great to be back uh, with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, this week along with you. It was in February that we originally had the W.H. Griffith Thomas lectureship scheduled and uh, divine providence snowed it out, Uh, but it was uh, uh, in the good providence of God, uh, Craig had uh, this week available for us to reschedule, and I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite some time. Our speaker for our lectureship is Dr. Craig Blazing, who serves as the executive vice president and provost and professor of theology Uh, over in Fort Worth at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, a sister school. Over the years, the academic departments have taken turns inviting prominent scholars to deliver lectures that are designed to be a scholarly treatment of significant issues in their field of study and vocational experience. One purpose of the lectureship is to provide the seminary community with an exposure to a variety of scholars from different theological perspectives. Uh, That just doesn't happen to be true this year. Uh, We share a theological perspective, and uh, we love that. Uh, This year, the the, uh, Theological Studies Department uh, extended the invitation to Dr. Craig Blasing as our guest lecturer for the week. His lecture series is entitled, Waiting for the Day of the Lord. Uh, As I mentioned, in 1976, he received his THM from Dallas Seminary, and three years later, earned his Doctor of Theology here. In 1988, he earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Beginning in 1980, Dr. Blazing served for 15 years on our faculty here at DTS as Professor of Systematic Theology. Then he served for seven years on the faculty of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And then uh, uh, recently, uh, in 2005, Uh, was the past president of the Evangelical Theological Society. He holds memberships in the International Association of Patristic Studies, North American Patristic Society, and the Society of Biblical Literature. He has published several works in the areas of patristics, eschatology, dispensationalism, and biblical and systematic theology. He's married to his wife, Diane. They have two children, and they are members of the Travis Avenue Baptist Church in Fort Worth. Uh, would you join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Blazing back to our chapel for the second lecture? Well, thank you, Dr. Bailey, and I want to especially express my appreciation uh, for the hospitality that I've received here during this time. Uh, it's been uh, really nice to stay in the, uh, up at the top of the Swiss Tower. Uh, I uh, noted when that building uh, began to go up, and uh, what a blessing uh, that is to Dallas Seminary to have uh, housing facilities like this. Uh, when I first came to Dallas Seminary, I was assigned to Lincoln Hall. And uh, Lincoln Hall is an object lesson. And, you know, yesterday we were talking about the day of the Lord and the desolation that comes at the end. Well, Lincoln is an object of that desolation. I mean, if you, if you go to its place, it's not there. It's just desolate there. Uh, and, uh, and I guess that's fitting. Uh, Lincoln Hall was a, uh, an old YWCA building the seminary uh, acquired. And, uh, and so students stayed in it. The rooms were really small. Uh, because, you know, it was uh, meant for, for women who would stay there and just, you know, kind of uh, overnight. And so <clears throat> it wasn't a, a student's uh, room, but, you know, we had to make do. And it had, uh, typically the rooms had a window that was taken up by a huge air conditioner uh, because you needed that because it was hot in there, which meant that you couldn't really see anything. So you're in a cubicle that pretty much so you can't see out or anything in there. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a monastic experience uh, in, 
in, in those days, uh, the, uh, the seminary, uh, you know, was all men, and so we're living in these little cubicles and, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting that one of the, the uh, first uh, uh, residents in Lincoln Hall went on to become a well-known sex therapist. Um, it's just obviously coincidental, I think, with that, <laughs> with that experience there. But, you know, the Lord leads in, in many interesting ways. And, uh, and so, you know, the, uh, the food has much improved here too, you know. Uh, in those days, the cafeteria was in the bottom in the basement of Lincoln. And, uh, you know, the seminary couldn't afford to put a lot of money in the food that it offered. So uh, we had some interesting things to eat. I was telling the uh, group at dinner last night that uh, one of the meals I remembered was uh, they served tamales one time. And uh, the, the food staff over there, uh, nobody was uh, on that food staff was from Texas, okay? And, uh, and they were trying to make do, of course, with, uh, you know, an inexpensive meal preparation. So they had got these tamales that come in a can wrapped in paper. Well, you know, no self-respecting Texan would, would eat something like that wrapped in paper, you know. <laughs> but, you know, when you're desperate, uh, you, you eat just about anything. Uh, but they served it. The thing is, it, it, it underscored the fact that they were not from Texas. They, they served these paper-wrapped tamales with the chili on top. <laughs> And, uh, and then there was a lot of students who, who weren't from Texas either, and, and they thought, surely that was the way to eat it. And, uh, you know, and I'd try to explain to them that that's not the way you eat a tamale. You know, you, you have to take that, that stuff off there and say, no, if it's served that way, that's the way you eat it. And I said, you know, knock yourself out. That, that's just, <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, commitment to authority. Uh, there was one resident in there, he could not afford paper wrapped tamales. Uh, you know, life was hard. And he lived on peanut butter. You know, you do what you can as a student. You know, you, you get by as you can. And this fellow, Bob Osborne was his name, he uh, decided that the way to make it through seminary was, was bread and peanut butter. Every meal. Four years. Bread and peanut butter. You know, it's a miracle. I mean, God somehow, you know, I mean, <laughs> allowed him to survive. And the thing is that at the end of that time, he got married. And, and uh, we were talking with his wife after they got married and said, you know, well, you know, how is it? She says, well, you know, it's just great. The only thing is, you know, he really likes peanut butter. <laughs> you know, God did that. I mean, that's just a God thing. Well, today we're talking about the day of the Lord in relationship to Daniel. Yesterday we saw the day of the Lord as both a, an abbreviated and as an extended pattern. In Scripture, the day of the Lord can be presented as a simple pattern of destruction, but also it can be presented as an extended event. And these two patterns work themselves into the typology of Scripture. Today, we're asking the question, how does this relate to Daniel's time of the end, the pattern that was seen in Daniel? This is a question that's not uh, usually addressed in critical studies for a number of reasons, one of which is the, a long-standing presumption in critical scholarship that apocalyptic has nothing to do with prophecy. Uh, they come, it was thought, from uh, different situations, different life situations, and, and besides that, it was believed uh, for a long time that they have different outlooks on the world, apocalyptic, expecting the uh, world to uh, come to a complete end, prophecy not. And so, as a result, in critical studies, uh, very little has been done in what the relationship might be between Daniel and the rest of the prophets. That is changing somewhat today because Daniel doesn't fit the prescribed uh, uh, elements that are typically uh, accorded to apocalyptic as a genre. But when we look at the Scripture canonically and we ask the question, how does Daniel fit with the prophets, and we ask the question about the intertextual relationship between Daniel and the prophets, we have to see that connection because Daniel itself presents that interconnection as we're going to see, and the New Testament demands it. So let's jump into, into the book of Daniel, and we're looking at some very familiar material here, uh, but what we're looking at is to see what are the intertextual, intertextual connections with the day of the Lord. 
The book of Daniel presents uh, personal experiences, dreams, and visions of Daniel, of course, his three friends and certain Babylonian and Median Persian kings whom they served. These personal experiences, dreams, and visions dramatically portray a pattern of trouble which will precede and form the setting for the establishment of the kingdom of God. Some of the dreams and visions present a sequence of kingdoms beginning with Babylon and extending in succession into the future. Two of these, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2 and Daniel's visions of the four beasts and the Son of Man in Daniel 7, present a four-kingdom sequence which ends with climactic divine judgment terminating the succession of Gentile powers and establishing in their place the everlasting kingdom of God. Here you have a diagram of these four kingdom sequences. In this four kingdom sequences, the identity of the first three is easy, easily established in the text. Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece, the fourth is unnamed. In Daniel 2, the climactic divine judgment is presented in a catastrophic but abbreviated picture of a rock striking and crushing a statue. Uh, in Daniel 7, the scene of the climactic divine judgment is given more detail and expanded into a narrated pattern. A ruler emerges from the fourth kingdom and through some political maneuvering attains to military and political dominance. His character and actions come into sharp focus, his pride and arrogance, his perpetration of war and persecution of the saints. A temporal duration is placed into the pattern, time, times, and half a time which is concluded by divine judgment and transference of kingdom authority to one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and to the saints of the Most High. In addition to these four kingdom sequences, we have two visions in Daniel 8 and 10 through 12, which present a two kingdom sequence. Both of these two kingdom sequences, however, follow Babylon. And so, for purposes of comparison with the four kingdom sequences, both of which include Babylon, we're going to include the already Babylon and refer to the two kingdom sequences as three kingdom sequences. So, to summarize, we have visions of a four kingdom sequence in Daniel 2 and 7, visions of a three kingdom sequence in Daniel 8 and 10 through 12. Both of the three kingdom sequences end in a pattern of trouble and judgment which parallels the pattern of trouble and judgment found at the end of the four kingdom sequence in Daniel 7. However, they add e detail that the pattern in Daniel 7 lacks. <clears throat> the new features include a temple desecration and cessation of sacrifice, which function as the point from which time is measured, with four approximately equal but separately different measurements. 2,300 mornings and evenings, or 1,150 uh, days, 1,290 days, 1,335 days, time times half a time. The vision in Daniel 11 to 12 gives the phrase abomination of desolation and notes the activity of Michael the archangel and predicts a resurrection from the dead as a feature of Israel's deliverance. So there's a progression to the complexity of patterns in Daniel's visions from the relatively simple image of a collision to a narrated pattern of an antagonist who's destroyed by God. The character portrayal of the antagonist also develops through these visions into a blasphemer who exalts himself as a god. It's apparent, uh, it is apparently this personal self-deification that makes him the focus of object, uh, Yahweh's wrath. No human power can oppose him. The saints are utterly defenseless and powerless before his malice. Only direct divine action destroys him and rescues the saints and establishes the kingdom of God. The deliverance of the saints in this developing pattern is typed in the personal experience of Daniel in the lion's den and his three friends in the fiery furnace. They remain true, faithful to God, refusing to worship Gentile idols whether that be an image set up on the plain of Dura or an actual living Gentile king. Daniel and his friends in each scene are utterly defenseless and at the mercy of the political power. Miraculously, both are delivered alive from their executions, leading to a proclamation of Yahweh as the true and living God. 
The removal of the sure and certain death of these Judeans by the mighty power of God functions as a type of the miraculous deliverance of the people of God at the end of the sequential kingdom visions, some even from actual death by resurrection in Daniel 12. There is no doubt at all that the Daniel 8 and 11 portraits apply to the character of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid king, who in the second century BC desecrated the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. Daniel 11 gives the details of his career and especially his campaign that resulted in the desecration of the temple and the abomination of desolation. However, the critical historical reading which attributes the culminating pattern of each of Daniel's sequences exclusively to the trouble caused by Antiochus Epiphanes flattens the text overlooking a complex literary typology taking place among the sequential kingdom visions. The same pattern, although subject to development by the addition of detail, is found at the end of one four-kingdom sequence as well as the end of both three-kingdom sequences. The kingdom identities in these sequences is clearly given in the text. The first three of the four kingdom sequences being the same as the three of the three kingdom sequences, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. Since the first three kingdoms in both sequences are explicitly parallel, the last kingdom in the three kingdom sequence and the last kingdom of the four kingdom sequence must be distinguished. The means, this means that the pattern appearing in the last kingdom of both sequences is a type. The pattern which Daniel 8 and 11 obviously apply to Antiochus Epiphanes, which Antiochus Epiphanes exemplified and enacted in the second century, was a type which Daniel 7 projects into the future beyond the second century BC. Although the pattern is abbreviated in Daniel 2, it joins Daniel 7 in projecting a judgment pattern that will precede the establishment of the kingdom of God. But the literary evidence of typology is also found within the three kingdom sequence. The principal evidence is found in the Daniel 11:36 to 12:13 passage where we find a repeated but much bolder character description. Uh, the description is given before 1136, of a, which is uh, clearly Antiochus Epiphanes, and then it's, there's a re repetition of character description, but much bolder, possibly a change of narrative role and the introduction of heightened, even eschatological features such as Michael, the angel, unparalleled trouble, and the resurrection of the dead. The repeated yet enhanced character description is important, involving as it does the oppressive ruler's self-deification. This is the passage, Daniel 11.36, that is quoted by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 and applied to a yet future coming man of lawlessness. Clearly the passage was read as future prophecy in the church. It is with this overall understanding of the typology structure in Daniel that we look at the vision of the 70 weeks in Daniel 9. The ninth chapter of Daniel addresses directly the concern that underlies the entire book, the concern for the restoration of Jerusalem, the return of Israel, and the fulfillment of the promises of blessing. Daniel offers a lengthy prayer of repentance and plea for restoration on the basis of Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years of desolation given in Jeremiah 25. A sign of this desolation and restoration had already been given in Daniel 4, where Nebuchadnezzar is driven from his throne for seven periods of time, his mind taken away and his state reduced to living like an ox in the field. After the seven periods, he is restored to his kingdom, glory, majesty, and splendor, and gives praise to God. In Daniel 9, the answer to Daniel's prayer reveals that Jerusalem will certainly be restored and rebuilt along with the temple, although in troubled times, at the end of, a, of 70 years, as prophesied by Jeremiah. Yet he is also given a revelation of another seven periods of time, namely 77s, a period that looks beyond the restoration prophesied by Jeremiah. A future destruction of the rebuilt city and the rebuilt temple is prophesied to take place after 69 sevens of time, 
from the decree to rebuild them. Preceding their destruction will be the coming and cutting off of an anointed one, a Messiah. This future destruction of the city and sanctuary culminates in an end, repeated twice in verse 26. The 70th seven is introduced in verse 27, presenting the pattern that we have seen typed in the sequential kingdom visions the pattern of a powerful ruler causing the temple sacrificial service to cease for half of a seven until he meets his decreed end. However, distinctive to this pattern is the full seven-year period in which the temple desecration is placed in the middle. The motif of war, which is associated with this character and the other visions, appears here in verse 26, a focus on Jerusalem. War is said to ensue until the end. This is the only place in Daniel that speaks of a future destruction of either Jerusalem or the temple, and both are included here. This prophesied event exceeds the historical event of temple desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes. That desecration did not include the destruction of the temple and the city. Once again, we are dealing with a typed pattern, not as claimed by critical scholars of an ex eventu description of the Antiochian event. I mean, they would have known that the temple and city were not destroyed. All of this is very interesting when we look at Jeremiah 25, the passage Daniel was reading and praying over with respect to which the angel Gabriel comes to enlighten him. For in that text, we find not only the conditions for the restoration, 70 years after Jerusalem's destruction and also subsequent to the destruction of Babylon. Uh, Remember that in Daniel 9.1, he says this is the first year of Darius the Mede, so Babylon has been destroyed, and that part of Jeremiah's prophecy has also been fulfilled. But we also find an extended prophecy of the cup of wrath in Jeremiah 25 given to all nations, including Jerusalem and Judah. And that judgment, which would extend from Jerusalem to Babylon, would engulf all nations as an entire world order would disappear and be reconstituted. This whole worldwide judgment prophesied by Jeremiah is being typed in Daniel's visions and being projected into the future long after the return that Jeremiah predicted. We also need to note that the sixth century destruction in Jeremiah 25 is spoken of in day of the Lord terminology. In Jeremiah 25, 30, the Lord roars from on high. We compare Amos 1 with Joel 3. Uh, Joel is a clear day of the Lord prophecy, and we see the interconnection with Amos and here with Jeremiah 25, followed by lament, wailing in verse 34 because of the Lord's fierce anger. They will be pierced by the Lord on that day, verse 33, reminiscent of the day of the Lord pattern in which Yahweh fights personally against the nations. Within the book of Jeremiah, this prophecy against the nations in Jeremiah 25 connects to the set of oracles against the nations in Jeremiah 46, which begin with a day of the Lord prediction. What this means is that there is an intertextual basis for linking the typed pattern of the emergence, turmoil, and eventual destruction of the violent, oppressive ruler in 927, Daniel 927, to the day of the Lord type in Jeremiah 25. The Jeremiah prophecy against Jerusalem and the nations, fulfilled in the 6th century B.C., carries over as a type intertextually in Daniel's prophecy of a future destruction of Jerusalem and divine judgment on the nations perpetrating it. Unique to Daniel, however, is, uh, in, is the structure of his vision contributed to the typology, focused on an oppressive ruler and the seven-year structure. Also, Daniel uh, gives uh, and uh, predicts an early occurrence of the type taking place in the second century, a prelude to the yet future eschatological fulfillment. And the distinction between the prelude, the early occurrence of the type, and its eventual fulfillment is established by the literary art of differing kingdom sequences and the timed projection of these 77s. Now we move to the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse 
is key in the progressive development of biblical eschatology and is a rich field for study. In the time we have, however, I want to focus on two issues. One, the integration and extension in the Olivet Discourse of the patterns we've been studying. The Olivet Discourse integrates the 70th week structural pattern of Daniel with the greater prophetic type of the day of the Lord. Furthermore, the Olivet Discourse extends the sequence of type occurrence by allowing the possibility, which we now know as an actuality, that the events that would take place in 70 AD would be another prelude to the final eschatological fulfillment, an occurrence of the type projecting the antitype yet further into the future. Looking from our vantage point in history, we can see this as an actuality actually to have been the case. We look more closely at both the integration of the pattern and the extension of its typed fulfillment. The Olivet Discourse is set in the context of Jesus' prediction that the temple then standing would be destroyed. The setting is He is coming out of the temple with His disciples. They are looking at the Herodian renovation of the temple and remarking on the wonderful architect, architectural uh, result, and He says, not one stone here will be left upon another. All will be turned down. He's talking about, uh, torn down. He's talking about the destruction of that temple. In Matthew, this temple prediction is conjoined to Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the city at the end of the previous chapter in Matthew. The city uh, will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed. Some day of the Lord prophecies speak of judgment coming upon Israel with a focused attack upon Jerusalem. Some day of the Lord prophecies speak of God's judgment on Gentile powers. The two-part day of the Lord pattern in Zechariah, which we saw yesterday, suggested as well by Joel's aggregate patterns, features both a military attack and destruction of Jerusalem, followed by a direct divine judgment on the attackers. The 70th week of Daniel witnesses a destruction of the city, Jerusalem, and its desecrated temple, followed by divine destruction of the oppressive ruler who perpetrated it. The prophecy of Jesus of the destruction of the city and the temple draws from both patterns in the Old Testament. The structure of the Olivet Discourse divides into two parts, two main parts. The first part, Matthew 24, 4 to 35, Mark 13, 5 to 31, Luke 21, 8 to 33, consists of a narrative of events leading up to the sign of the Son of Man coming on the clouds. This narrative is followed by a conclusion or teaching point, the parable of the budding trees. The second part, Matthew 24, 36 to 25, 46, Mark 13 and Luke 21, as you can see, asserts that it is not known when the day will come. It is followed by exhortations to be ready. The second part, unlike the first, varies considerably in its length between synoptic accounts, with Matthew's version being the longest. Matthew concludes this second part with an account of the judgment of the nations by the reigning Son of Man. This account aptly concludes the warnings of the second part of the Olivet Discourse, but also adds a completing feature to the narrative of the first part, bringing the entire Olivet Discourse to its conclusion. And here, just comment that, uh, you know, the basic main ways of interpreting the first part, the narrative of the Olivet Discourse, uh, you have uh, one approach to see all of this is entirely future, a futurist view. One is to see all of this entirely historical. There's your preterist view. It's all first century events. The majority uh, approach is to see this as in some way involving both historical and future uh, events. The question is, how do you relate those two together? And uh, the, the majority approach has been to divide that narrative into parts. Part of it refers to the historical past. Part of it restore, refers to the, sto- to the future. What I'm suggesting is another way, and that's to see the whole narrative pattern relating to past and future functioning typologically. Let's see how that happens. When we look at the first part of the Olivet Discourse, the narrative events leading to 
the sign of the Son of Man coming on the clouds, it's easy to see that it has the structure of Daniel's time of the end, the 70th week. It has a beginning and an end, and it's marked in the middle by the abomination of desolation. The Lord not only uses Daniel's exact term, but in Matthew's account makes explicit reference to Daniel when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. The narrative is marked throughout by the activity of false Christs who will lead many astray, just as in Daniel's time of the end, uh, it's marked by the activity of an oppressive ruler from the beginning to the end. War and persecution of the saints are highlighted features, both here and in Daniel. The abomination of desolation is in an act of the oppressive ruler in Daniel. In the Markan account, the Olivet Discourse, uh, the neuter abomination is referenced by a masculine participle, focusing attention on the perpetrator. The Lucan version substitutes Jerusalem surrounded by armies for the abomination of desolation. This reference calls attention to the impending destruction of the city, which implies impending destruction for the temple as well, its ultimate desolation. This is particularly a feature in Daniel 9.26. And finally, the pattern concludes with the sign of the Son of Man coming on the clouds in unmistakable reference to Daniel 7.13. So the Danielic pattern is clear. However, we also see in this narrative features that belong to the day of the Lord description. They appear at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the narrative. At the beginning are mentioned war, famine, earthquakes, pestilences, terrors, great signs from heaven. Darkness, a key description of the day of the Lord, increases through the middle of the narrative as the days are cut short. It is a time of wrath. In the middle is the siege of Jerusalem. The concluding description notes the signs in the sun, moon, and stars, notably the darkening of the sun and moon, the stars falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shaken. Fear and trembling grip people on the earth in anticipation of the end. These features unite the entire narrative as a manifestation of the day of the Lord. However, the one feature that particularly unifies the whole Drawing it together as a unified process is the imagery of labor and childbirth. The agony of the day of the Lord was described in Isaiah 13 by the metaphor of a woman in travail. They will be dismayed, pains and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus uses this image to mark the onset of the narrative pattern. The early appearance of the day of the Lord are signs, the the early appearance of day of the Lord's signs are the beginning of birth pangs. It's interesting to note that in some of the commentaries, some of the commentators treat that remark as dismissive. Well, these are just the beginning of birth pangs. I note that none of them are women. (laughs) No woman would say, well, that's just the beginning of labor. When labor begins, that's a major process, and we are into a process that will move right down to its completion. The day of the Lord labor imagery is linked to the Danielic image of the appearing of the Son of Man at the end in a remarkable intertextual connection. There is somebody coming. And the beginning of this day of the Lord is the beginning of that coming that's going to eventuate in an appearing. What we see so far in the narrative of the Alva Discourse, this first part of the Alva Discourse, is a day of the Lord integrated with the structure of Daniel's 70th week. The integral nature of the narrative sequence is confirmed by the concluding parable, the parable of the budding tree or trees. This parable relates to the appearing of the Son of Man, or relates the appearing of the Son of Man to everything in the sequence up to that time. When you see all these things, you know that He is near at the very gates. However, His next statement, which ends the parable, 
and ends this first part of the discourse, taken together with the very next statement, the beginning of the second part of the discourse, reveals the possibility of a typological extension of the entire pattern up to the point of his appearing. For he says in 2434, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The all these things were in the previous verse that said, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, which means that they're all the things up to the point of his appearing. And all these things are going to take place, he says, in this generation. However, the very next statement in 2436, he says, but no one knows the day, the time, or that day or hour. Now, there are many, of course, who think that this remark about the day or the hour refers to the appearing at the end of the narrative sequence, since he used the term parousia in this way in Matthew 2430, and to which he made reference again in 2433. Support for that view is drawn from the fact that in the Matthean account of this second part of the Olivet Discourse, several references are made to the coming of the Son of Man. And it would seem natural to link that phrase and its variants to the coming of the Son of Man in the first part of the discourse where that's used in 24, 27, and 30. The day or hour would then be the day or hour of the appearing at the end of the narrative sequence. But we need to note that day or hour in Matthew and time in Mark and day in Luke are commonly recognized by interpreters as referring to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the day of His coming. And in biblical parlance, the coming of the Lord and the day of His coming are often interchangeable, as in Malachi 3, for example, He comes, but who can endure the day of His coming? And in, in 2 Peter 3, we have the same, the coming and then the day of the Lord. However, most do not consider the possibility that the day of the Lord can be presented both in a simple description and as a narrated event, nor the descriptive presentation of the entire narrative sequence in the first part of the Olivet Discourse, not just its end as being the day of the Lord. From the start, the entire narrative pattern is the day of the Lord, a notion that is reinforced by the labor metaphor that unites the pattern. This metaphor offers a conceptuality in which it is possible to refer to a coming both as process and arrival in the same discourse. Just as we talk about labor beginning, the baby is coming. Uh, you can speak of the baby coming and the baby will come. The whole labor is the coming. We talk about the arrival at the end. The focus of parousia in 2430 is on the resulting appearance, the arrival of the one who comes. The focus in 2436 is the commencement of the coming, the starting point which goes back to the reference to the beginning of labor pains in the first part of the discourse. The day of His coming begins as a labor process that leads to His arrival. Taking this view allows us to avoid a problem associated with trying to correlate the teaching of the budding tree with the imminency language in the second part of the discourse. The parable of the budding tree or trees places the appearing at the end of a greatly intensifying process, one that has people in a state of terror and alarm, one that has led to a point of imminent expectation. It is a sign-based sign-induced imminency. In contrast, the imminency in the second part of the discourse is signless. People are generally not in a state of alarm and great distress, but they are in their normal routines. There are no signs that intervene and lead one to an imminent expectation. Imminency prevails because of the lack of any signs. It is a signless imminence like the possibility of night robbery. 
recognizing that we are dealing in the second part of the discourse with the day of the Lord as a whole, the whole day of His coming, along with the recognition that the first part of the discourse presents the entire narrative sequence as the day of His coming, allows the second part of the discourse to harmonize consistent with the literary types and metaphors that are employed in each part. However, understanding the Olivet Discourse this way allows us to see the typological extension of the pattern more clearly. The appearing of the Son of Man takes place in a pattern sequence that's consistent with prophetic expectation. The entire pattern sequence up to the appearing of the Son of Man would take place in that generation. However, the Lord says that no one knows when the full pattern that ushers His glorious appearing would occur, which means that it was possible that what would happen in that generation would not be the full pattern, the final day of the Lord. What was then a possibility is seen today as an actuality. What took place in 70 AD was not His coming, but only a type a type which the Lord Himself indicated was a distinct possibility. And since it was a type, as has been the case with types throughout biblical history, the full pattern projects to the future as the eschatological coming of the day of the Lord. In our study of the day of the Lord, we've seen a time of the end, a tribulational pattern revealed to Daniel, projected into the future, yet intertextually linked to the day of the Lord judgment pattern that befell Jerusalem in the sixth century. The projection of this pattern parallels the projected expectation of an eschatological day of the Lord yet to come, which means that its intertextual link is already typological. Within Daniel itself, yet further type fulfillment is revealed in a second century occurrence of the type in part, reinforcing the expectation of the yet future occurrence to come. The Olivet Discourse affirms that occurrence of this time of the end pattern at the approximate time revealed to Daniel, 77s leading to the first century, yet also reveals a further type and a type extension while at the same time integrating the whole pattern of eschatological expectation as the day of the Lord, structured in the manner revealed to Daniel. The patterns converge as they project to a future coming of the Lord. And tomorrow, we raise the question, how does this relate to the rapture? Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for the Scripture that You give to us. We thank You for the hope that we have in Christ, a hope that is sure. And Lord, You've taught us to pray that Your kingdom come. You've revealed to us that in this time, this is a time of grace, a time when many may come to repentance. Lord, strengthen us in that witness and that proclamation of the gospel, even as we look to that day when the Lord comes. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.